waiting to interview Phil Bronstein, but this bust is of the man who made the San Francisco Chronicle famous. He is the legendary Herb King. Perhaps the best three-doc columnist in America during his lifetime and after. Folks, we're back again with Executive Vice President and Editor-at-Large Phil Bronstein of the San Francisco Chronicle and the Hearst Corporation. And, um, and so, Chairman of the Board of the Center for Investigative Reporting, which is I'm very proud of. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Know that. Was that, is that recent? Or is that the... It actually happened about six months ago, but I don't, I don't think anybody said anything for a few months. You kept it quiet. How did that? Let's let's talk about that a little bit. What? Uh, how did that come about? How did becoming chairman come about, or how did not keeping it quiet come about? Both. <laughs> well, there was a, a board vote. I think it was December, maybe November, December of last year. Um, I'd been on the board for a number of years, and uh, you know, checked with uh, my bosses at Hearst to make sure that they were okay with it. They were, um, and I think it's a, a fabulous opportunity to take. Nonprofit investigative journalism and see if we can make that fly. It's going on other places around the country, obviously, ProPublica, Center for Public Integrity, Texas Tribune. So I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in that. I, I think that there was just no, I wasn't really keen on an, an announcement just because I think those things tend to go into the ether. Um, and eventually, I think they, they sent out a press release about some other changes and included that. How does that affect here, or does it? doesn't really, you know, there's a very good relationship ongoing um, between the Chronicle newsroom and CIR, where there are a lot of CIR, particularly California Watch stories, which is part of CIR, that um, go into the Chronicle. Yeah. And, and a number, yeah. a lot of other publications and a lot of other uh, media outlets. So I think it's, uh, I think it's only useful in terms of, um, you know, we're all searching for the same thing, which is an answer as to how to support good journalism. All right. And you're, you've been in a position, I think, for the last, what, two years now where you've been looking at new it's media? Three, yeah. yeah. Three years. And you can bring that over to this new post, right, in a sense? Well, I mean, they, you know, there are people there, a third my age, who are much more equipped to understand that. There's a Hey, I'll be 50 next year. Age doesn't matter. <laughs> 50, you're just a kid, man. Thanks. Um, <laughs> We have some people over there. I mean, for instance, they did a seismic uh, safety investigation um, not too long ago. It was really quite good. But, but they also did a, an app, an iPhone app, where you could, we're sitting right here, if you had the app, it was called Fault Line, I think it was a cute hmm. name. Yeah. And, uh, and you could determine whether you were on, you know, what, what, what the safety factor was of the place you were standing. Let's say we're right here in San Francisco. It's probably all liquefaction zones or something, and then get all sorts of useful tips about what to do and how to prepare and so forth. So, and they put that together just in a, a few, I think, a matter of weeks. Yeah. So they're practicing the kind of things that I'm talking to people about in terms of, you know, the new, all the new digital tools and all the startups and all the, the various ways in which journalism is being helped by technology. Yeah, get you on tout because the one thing the tout people need is someone like you with experience, even on their board. You know, I think you'd be. Hold on a second, Michael. This is the man right here. Yeah. You'd be perfect. You'd be perfect. Uh, you better be careful, Zenny. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Rupert Murdoch. Mm -hmm. I mistakenly thought you were making a comparison between old media and new media, which I sent out an apology for. Covered myself there. But what do you think about what they did in terms of phone hacking? I know you've written about it, but it hasn't been on video before, so it'll be a great platform to you know, get that out and match it with what you've written. Uh, and I think I'm interested in how an organization that has standards and practices like the San Francisco Chronicle and the Horse Corporation looks at what happened with News of the World. Because, and is that to imply they don't have standards and practices? Well, it's to imply certainly that standards and practices were not being executed there, and they were not being the practices were not being practiced. Um, I think that they were engaged in blatantly illegal activity. Um, it, it almost sounded like an ongoing criminal enterprise. We don't know the scope of it yet. But I, I, you know, I have written that we have to be mindful of the fact that reporters end up in jail, unfortunately, a 
a fair amount these days. There's certainly more than they used to. Right. Oftentimes for just doing their job. So reporters can run afoul of, of laws, uh, can, can go to jail in principle, but there's a big difference between principle and you know, digging up dirt in ways that are patently illegal. i got to follow up on that. You said more often now than in the past. Why is that? Because first the last Bush administration, and now even more so the Obama administration, made it policy to go after the press on issues like confidentiality of sources. So they are being, the Obama administration is being at least as aggressive. And in fact, you know, I talk to the chief corporate counsel of Hearst fairly regularly, and she's a big champion of this kind of thing, First Amendment rights, and, uh, and trying to get a federal shield law going for reporters, for journalists. Uh, and it's tougher. It's tougher now even than when George Bush was president. Why that is, I don't know. But uh, maybe it's because sometimes matters of national security are involved. But there is a delicate balance here, and the press exists well, exists for many reasons, but one of the reasons it exists is because the power of, of government is so overwhelming mm -hmm. right. Right. that there has to be a check and there has to be a balance. And so when you ask about things, as the, say the New York Times has, about CIA domestic wiretapping, uh, relationships with, with the large phone companies, that may be certainly something the government doesn't want to get out, but that it is in the interest of the public to have it get out. Is, it, is this a post-WikiLeaks reaction that we're seeing? Or does no, WikiLeaks no, no, have anything no, no, to do no. with I it think at all? We, well, WikiLeaks was, you know, was in there somewhere. If you, if mm -hmm. you did a timeline on Storify or something, you, know, you, right. would, you would discover that WikiLeaks is just part of the discussion. But I don't, it didn't start there, and it didn't, certainly has not ended there. Um, the, the Obama administration has gone on after you know, sourcing on a lot of stories. Now, with respect to phone hacking, you wrote in the Times, excuse me, not the Times, or the Huffington Post, that it's quite common for journalists to use private investigators or sources to get information, but there was a big but in your Well, I mean, course. the but is, the, the premise of the piece was supposed to be a little provocative was, we're all a phone call or two away from someone who knows how to hack into somebody else's life. A, because it's so ubiquitous these days, technology allows us to do so many things. Um, you know, it used to be, I had a police scanner in my car for years, and every once in a while, you know, I'd... Do you drive around with a scanner on looking for I, trouble? I, I used to, I used to. <laughs> I, have my, you know, I have three kids now, so I'm looking for less trouble, but occasionally you would get, in those days, cell phone conversations. You would hit a frequency and you get a cell phone. So it wasn't that hard to do. It's harder to do now um, with uh, digital as opposed to analog and encryption and everything else, but anything that's made can be broken. So the idea was that we had the ability to do this and, and um, uh, that I think reasonable and relatively law-abiding journalists would not. Private eyes, private investigators in England, you know, Jack Palladino is a big private eye here in San Francisco. I've known for many years. Lectured at the city, I think it's the City College of London, to a journalist saying, you know, you all should be investigators more because journalism isn't necessarily providing you all with jobs. And he discovered um, something he didn't know, which was private eyes in, in England are sort of one level above thugs, <laughs> according to what he told me. Whereas here, you know, they a little more respectable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we may know private eyes, we may talk to, I've talked to a half a dozen at least over the years as a reporter to try and get information, just like you're getting information from any source. Uh, but to use them to then go and you know, bug somebody else, it's a very different story. I mean, Anthony Pelicano did that in L.A. and he's in jail. What's fascinating about what you just said and what you wrote is it implies the existence of a culture such that someone would say, oh yeah, News of the World definitely did this, of course they did, but moreover, Murdoch, both Rupert and James, knew about it. I mean, by circumstance. Well, I, I you know... I can't or is you, that fair? I mean, you know, what's fair is what's, what's accurate, and at mm -hmm. this point we're not sure. I mean, I think a lot of people have made assumptions that you can't be the CEO of a company and know a lot about the details of one aspect of it and not know details about the other. And endless stories have been written by people who worked for Murdoch, and I never have. They're sort of arguing both sides that, uh, well, when you run that big a company, which is his case that he made before Parliament, 
you know, you can't have your finger on everything, but somebody up that ch food chain, I mean, I know that uh, I've been editors of two metros, both in San Francisco, and if there were confidential sources, a uh, sensitive story being used, I needed to know who they were. Yeah. And in the case of Balco, I mean, I, I, I could have gone to jail along with Mark and, and Lance. And Lance, sorry, Mark, Mark Fernot, Wanda, and Lance Williams. And Lance right. Williams, right. Um, in the steroids case, because they were not would not give up confidentiality of their source. Um, and, uh, you know, they could have come after me as well, because, I mean, I didn't made no bones about it that I was aware of who their source was, because that's part of our practice. You can't have a story like that where somebody high up in the organization doesn't know who who your source is and under what circumstances you got that information. What do you think is going to happen to Rupert Murdoch and the news of the world? Not well, News Corp. News of the world is already shut down, but News Corp itself. And it's, does this point to Fox News and how they do business? In well, the I, a lot of people have tried to point to Fox News. I have not yet seen any indication, any fact, presented as a fact even, that says that Fox News you know, pays, I mean look, ABC News pays for information. Mm -hmm. They pay people, they can call it licensing or the, you know, some other ruse, but the reality is that news organizations in the United States do pay, some do pay, mostly um, television, network television, and obviously the tabloid shows. Right. So. I, you know, I have, since I haven't seen any indication that Fox News sort of had this same culture, they've been criticized a lot for the culture they do have, <laughs> right. but I have not seen anything concrete that suggests to me that part of that culture is that you hack into people's phones. Does this give, since you're also well, part of the executive organization of Hearst itself, and I'm going to ask this, and I can understand if you don't want to answer it, but... Has Hearst looked at this from a market share standpoint and, say, and said, you know, looking out long term, what's going to happen to them? What can we grab? Is well, this an opportunity for us? You know? I mean, Hearst, you know, has cable mm -hmm. operations, but they are, you know, it's history channel. And, you know, this is A&E. It's, it's not a Fox News kind of organization. I, I mean, I don't sit in those meetings that's far above my head to discuss, you know, the sort of larger international business implications. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see a specific beneficiary of that. I mean, if there's going to be a beneficiary of Fox imploded tomorrow, it would be CNN and MSNBC. From radio standpoint. Um, what's the basic lesson for anyone in journalism school who is, will be watching this video? Actually, let me kill that. Hold on a second. I'm sick. Well, okay. Killed. Sorry. The lesson for journalism students is uh, don't break the law, and, and certainly not if you haven't discussed it with a high level editor <laughs> or producer <laughs> at your organization. Uh, but, you know, the, I mean, we, we credibility is the most valuable thing we have. And I would say we have, you know, precious little left these days with the public. Mm -hmm. So I think when you do something like that, you know, the, the most painful response you can get from the public is, yeah, we knew that already. Which, you know, I also took, and correct me if I'm wrong from your Huffington Post piece, that you go through all this work, you dig, you hire a private investigator, you, you, you hack a phone into a phone, hack into a voicemail, but how valuable today is the information you get from it? I mean, considering the, the speed well, of information and everything. If you, you go, know. I mean, you know, yeah. they count, if you're counting in aggregate numbers, that is to say, how many newspapers do you sell? Mm -hmm. How many uh, page views do you get on your website? You know, it does count. If, if you get some scandalous scoop, that's not what most mainstream media are into these days. But a lot of media are into that. And it means, I think it means something. If you get the, you know, if you get uh, Prince Charles talking about how he wishes he were certain, you know, sanitary hygiene <laughs> or something, you know, that's, a lot of people are going to read that. And a lot of people are going to want to know about that. So I think... It would be a game changer. It has value. Yeah. It has value to, the, to those organizations where that's the sort of meat and potatoes. Now... How long, how much, 
what's the legs of this story? I mean, depends on how far know, it goes. I mean, if it you know if it starts affecting profoundly, if I mean Fox News is value of the company is about down what ten billion dollars or something. But you know, if the if the company itself is threatened, if the members of the board of Fox decide, look like they're going to take some action themselves. It's going to involve Rupert James Murdoch. If the if the scandal gets wider, more people Scotland Yard are arrested, more journalists are arrested, or particularly for us, if there is a if there is a, a some kind of burgeoning U.S. angle to this, I think that, that it'll go on for quite some time. And you've met Rupert Murdoch, right? I have. What do you think of the man now versus you know? Or has well, anything changed? I, I, you know, I mean, I, as I say, I've never worked for him. That, that would be the test, I think. That's how people would get to know him or not. Uh, we had a brief conversation. It was a crowded place. I couldn't understand a thing he said. <laughs> um, I think it was partly uh, a heavy accent for me, anyway, and, and partly uh, he, he mumbles a lot. Yeah. But I understood his testimony. There was nothing there that was... No, that was mumbled. quite clear. Um, and his wife could throw a good right hook. Or white slap. Well, that became a not only a big story, but maybe it's not even ironic that it apparently helped him. The Guardian wrote some story soon, moments thereafter, saying this would help Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's you know we're we're in we're in this bizarre uh, culture and have probably always been where you're never quite sure what's going to affect the rotation of the Earth. It's interesting. I th although what's fun for me though is because it's new media, it's a digital window, you know, a digital mirror. Don't you think it's fun to watch how people respond so quickly to these things? I think it's great, and I think it tells you a lot. It yeah. doesn't tell you everything. And I think you have to look at it and filter it through the right filters, analyze it in the way that's useful for you, depending on who you are. But I think having all this information is really fascinating. It's one of the things we've been talking about at Hearst in terms of how editors make decisions. Chronicle shifting gears now, because I think we probably milked that as much as we can. The Chronicle has a new app. Hmm? Talk about that for a second. Well, you know, there were a lot of really smart people who uh, put that together, and it took quite a while. I mean, there were some uh, fits and starts in there about you know who would develop it and so forth. But I think it's a I think it's a really good experience, and I think that it's um, I mean I think the New York Times app is pretty boring now. People are using it and paying for it, hmm. but I think the Chronicles is much more user friendly and. It, I think all these apps can be a very rich experience that people had with a newspaper, but in the digital space, so that it's more accessible. It's accessible, obviously, on any kind of device and any place you go, and I think that's useful. I think we're all um, working towards and struggling with the idea of, okay, what exactly should go on there? Mm -hmm. But again, as you suggested, you know, we have real-time response from people. We know exactly what they're looking at. When, how, how they're reading it. I mean, they're heat and maps. And they'll comment immediately. And they're comments, but yeah. they're heat maps these days that, that show how people are scrolling through a story and do they get to the end. Yeah. One of my big things has always been what happens when they get to the end, and if you've engaged them, how do you keep their engagement? Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, it's one thing to throw a bunch of links there to them to go off to, but, you know, how are you as a, as a media organization engaging these people? Well, today you're engaging a lot of people. No kidding. <laughs> so let's talk about that one as we, because what motivated you to write that piece? Well, I think it, it says in the column that, um, I mean, I, I've, I've written pieces before about is there room for compassion in journalism? Um, I mean, I think it's an open, ongoing question. Some people would consider it inappropriate for journalism, and some people would consider it you know, the, the humane and human thing to do. I, I basically would argue that there is room for compassion. It's, it's a, hard to know where, the, where to draw the line. In this particular case, you know, I, I was struck over time with how many commenters were really vicious in, about tragedies. And, you know, it, there's kind of a gallows humor. It certainly goes on in newsrooms all the time, so that's one thing. But this was with the kids who were swept off the falls in mm -hmm. Yosemite. And this guy in Hawaii who was who, uh, got hit by a rogue wave and got sucked into a blowhole by the ocean and got lost at sea. And, and the comments were, you know, essentially suggesting that they were stupid and careless and deserved what they got. 
I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a stretch. But there were. Do you think that they would have the same opinion of one of their loved ones was the victim? Well, not precisely. Not. I mean, uh, that that was one of my points. I mean, it happens to be that I know the wife of the guy who mm. died in Hawaii. He's right, one right, of my right. kids' right. Uh, teachers at school. Right. And so, you know, there was a particularly tragic story there because she had uh, stage four breast cancer. And they'd gone to Hawaii and they just had a baby six months ago. They'd gone to Hawaii to, you know, have for some a little R&R before she was supposed to go in for a double mastectomy. And boom, loses her husband. I mean, it was shocking to all of us who knew that. And then to see those and to talk to people in the family about how you respond. I mean, she, one of the headlines, I think, in the Santa Rosa Press Democrat was, you know, Marin woman defends her boyfriend. Why do you have to defend, you know, your boyfriend's just been killed, I mean, essentially, and you have this 11-year relationship, it's the love of your life, you have the six-month-old, you're about to go in for a double mastectomy, but you got to defend him against all these uh, accusations that he was being foolish and careless. Which is a double pain. To lose Which is more than a double pain. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it really is. So I basically I said, you know, I mean, look, free commenting is a debate that everyone's had, including us here at the SFK. We've had that. Um, and that's an ongoing debate of do you just allow people to comment and you only have terms of service that really disallow the most extreme stuff, hate speech and so on. Or do you moderate them? Or do you filter them? Do you... Uh, seek registration so people can't hide behind anonymity. And I say yes. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I have my views yeah. about that, but in this particular case, because really, some of the commenters have threatened people here. That's yeah, yeah, that. and it's really you know, including you know, I've including me, that. you know, and yeah. me. So, but the really the point of the column was, you know, where is it, where is it, a little human dignity mm -hmm. and compassion uh, for these people, particularly the people left behind. I mean. Whether this guy David Potts, um, who I didn't know, got too close to the edge or wasn't respectful enough of nature, so is really at this point besides the point. I'm curious to ask you, John Libertini, who was a local anchor here, a local field reporter in Sacramento, to make a long story short, went to a, a memorial in a cemetery, tried to get a news story, and even though they didn't want to talk to him, he insisted, and the family went off and tried to attack him, and all that wound up on caught on camera on NBC, MSNBC. Was it appropriate for him to be in that situation? I personally thought not, but am I wrong? He said he kept saying, "I'm just doing my job," but it looked like he was using, he was milking them in a way that I don't think they wanted. You no, know, in that in that circumstance, mm -hmm. Sonny, I don't. You know, I, I would have had to have seen it. Yeah. Really, to make a judgment, it's one thing to try. To, I mean, I've been to grieving families myself as a reporter and tried to get uh, comment and photos, and you know, generally you you do it. You get a lot further in those things if you know if people, despite their grief, understand what it is you're trying to do. That you're not trying to you know, sort of harm their loved one. Um, when you turn the debate itself into television or into video. I think that you really, you know, that's a, that may be a very different story. If people, I mean, technically, if you're not trespassing, I suppose you could do anything mm -hmm. and, and broadcast anything. But uh, I think if you sort of turn, if you set up a circumstance of conflict and then you make that conflict the subject of your of your video, which, which is what that's he a little did. questionable, yeah. Yeah, that's what would what happen. Uh, in closing, how's Chronicle doing? Well, it's, it's still here. <laughs> um, just, I believe, just hired a new business editor, um, and as you, as you noted, they have, we have a new, relatively new iPad app. I'm sure we'll be developing uh, apps for Android devices as well, and anything else that's out there. Um, we just keep pushing ahead. I mean, you know, the idea is, how do you transform yourself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not into a completely different organization, but into a media outlet a resource for people that responds to the way people want to get their information these days. And that you know, that's changed, and as you know better than anyone, is changing rapidly. So, you know, we're trying to, to keep up with that change and, you know, ideally would like to be a little ahead of it. We see the days where the Chronicle 
or another example, the late San Francisco Examiner, the late one that you ran, mm -hmm. had its name on institutions like the Beta Breakers, or if I go, I mean, is that, if I go to Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal Constitution is still seemingly everywhere, you know, but is that? Well, I think if you don't know, it's, it's, um, it's probably not worth the money that, that news organizations used to pay, you know, a million mm -hmm. bucks to have a, to, <laughs> to uh, help sponsor a banner for yourself at, uh, at the ballpark. But I think to the extent that news organizations can get out in communities, I mean, I remember, you know, when the Chronicle, when I was running the Examiner, the Chronicle used to pay several hundred thousand dollars to sponsor the Chinese New Year's Parade in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But at that time, and this was, you know, many moons ago, the people at the Chronicle wouldn't come to the parade. So I would get a bunch of Examiner people, including Phil and Andy, uh, <laughs> Phil Matier and Andy Ross at the time, and we would go to the parade and we would sit in the grandstand and we would be judges and Rose Pack, who was the yeah. host of the parade, yeah. would announce that we were there and we'd go to the banquet. So, and, and what the Chronicle at the time got were, were a couple of banners in the parade and the, and the value of the, of the banners in the parade were, I, I don't know what. Um, but, so, you know, I think we were getting out of the community and taking advantage of it, and they were paying the money. We don't, and I don't think wow. we want to do that wow. anymore. <laughs> Phil, thanks all for your time. Thanks, Sandy. You